Hello again, welcome back to another video and as you can clearly see I have headed back out to the bush and I am in a location that I have never been before. It is quite a fair way away from my usual stomping grounds. Now I don't have much of an idea of what I can expect to see but I am quite sure that this is going to be a cracking adventure. The walking track very rapidly got rather steep and certainly not something my pre-cross country self would have been able to attempt. But even though my knees were quickly beginning to hate me, it was worth every step. Alright, first tree, let's take, oh hang on, I see something. Ah, this is Hulk, ah. Oh. I was gonna say Holconia Imanis, but on second thought it might not be. This spider, it seems, is not Holconia Imanis, which is the huntsman species I most frequently encounter in my field videos, but the closely related Holconia insignis. The patterning, which admittedly isn't that apparent in this spider since it's still only a juvenile, is nonetheless markedly different from that of Holconia imanis. Notably the appearance is more mottled and the bold black line that runs down the center of the opisthosoma is absent in this spider. Holconia insignis is quite a wide ranging species and overlaps in distribution with Holconia insignis to a considerable extent. However of the two it does appear to be much less frequently encountered. And many of you are probably familiar with how I search for Huntsman at this point, but just in case you're new here, what I'm looking for is stuff like this. So logs or trees that have large sheets of loose bark, because that's what a lot of Huntsman species like to hide on there. And of course, having said that, I find nothing at all, just my luck. Oh, actually, there's a rather interesting looking beetle here. This beetle was identified on iNaturalist as an Echnolagria species. And another interesting beetle, this one from the genus Amarygnus, a common inhabitant of tree trunks, which is where this one was found. All right, let's give this a look. Oh, hello, scorpion. And you can probably tell, but this is a different species of scorpion to what I usually see. This is a member of the genus Lycas, and uh, the wind is howling like this swirling storm inside. Yeah, it's, it's very, very loud and really interrupting my narration, but hmm, nothing I can do about it. But I haven't seen one of these in the wild in years, so I'm actually really overjoyed by this. They can be a little bit defensive, so I'm going to test this scorpion's temperament. Oh, it actually seems quite docile. So this is a member of the family Boothidae. And it's gone. Oh, I've just seen something else. There, we have a member of the family Trachycosmidae. These are known as flat spiders for uh, very visible reasons. And like huntsmen, they sh and like huntsmen, they have a body that is well adapted to living in extremely tight crevices. And this one actually looks injured. Oh yeah, I don't like the look of that at all, to be honest. Can see some silk in here, so I presume this is ah hello. That looks like it's an isopeda for sure, but I can't quite tell what species. Uh, oh yeah, that would be Isopeda Vasta. Can see some banding on the front legs. And also those chelicerae are quite large and don't really have much hair on them. So, yep, that is Isopeda Vasta. These logs are really close to the track, so I don't have that much hope, but you never know. Hmm. Oh, hello, quite, a, quite an impressively sized snail here. This would appear to be a member of the family Caminidae, which are native to Australia. So this isn't one of those pest garden snails, 
this is a native species. As for its exact identity, I'm not entirely sure. It could be Sparrowspira fraseri, the Fraser's banded snail, but again, that's a pretty tentative guess. But either way, that is quite an impressive looking snail and really not something I was expecting to encounter in this fairly dry area. And of course, when I put the log back, I'm going to be extra careful not to accidentally crush it. Oh, and look at those eyes sticking out under there. So cute. While I was mostly there for the animals, the plant life did not disappoint either. Native wildflowers of all kinds were blooming in abundance, and among the most stunning were the violet flowers of Hovia acutifolia. This species was especially abundant in the dry, open eucalypt forest close to the summit, covering entire hillsides and making for a most picturesque scene. These attractive shrubs provide food and shelter for a variety of smaller animals, such as this Paropsisterna species. Fungi too made an appearance, notably the orange brackets of Trametes coccinea, one of the more familiar and recognisable fungi in the bushlands around Brisbane. This species most often occurs on fallen logs, although it is far from fussy and can often show up in more unusual locations. Many human-made wooden structures are fair game for these fungi. Much of the walk had at this point been through open, dry eucalypt forest. But as the path began to meander down, the surroundings slowly transitioned into a denser, lusher habitat. So now I'm in more of a subtropical rainforest kind of area, which means that I may find a greater variety of animals, with the drawback of the lighting being absolutely terrible. But let's see what I can find anyway. Nothing at all. Ooh, I don't believe it. Okay, so I know what you're thinking. You're probably saying this is a funnel web. It is not, but it is, like funnel webs, a member of the infraorder Mygalomorphy. And you can probably see the spider right there. It has a pair of extremely long spinnerets, much longer than those of funnel webs, as a matter of fact. And they help it create this rather extensive web. My gallimorphs as a whole, they don't tend to wear very much, but this spider is most certainly an exception. Hello there. I did forget to name this spider while filming. I had a bit of a brain fart and was probably a tiny bit stressed from getting myself lost. But anyway, this is Australothele Jamies and I, a member of the family Euagridae and rather common in the rainforests around southeastern Queensland. Oh, hello. I was not expecting to see that here. So this is Ostrosalomona falcata. It is a species of katydid from the subfamily Conocephalinae, which are the cone-headed katydids. And if I zoom in on the katydid's head, the reason for that name becomes pretty obvious. Ostrosalomona species are quite generalistic in terms of diet. They'll go for just about anything. They'll feed on fruits, nuts, and even dead or dying insects. And while they're not especially visible from this angle, they are equipped with quite a powerful set of mandibles, which of course allows them to tackle the wide variety of food items that they consume. All right, let's give this a look. Oh, hello. Look at that, Hormurus. So these guys, quite a familiar face on this channel at this point. Hormurus are among the most common scorpions here in southeastern Queensland. And as you can probably tell from the fact that I just picked it up nonchalantly, they are pretty much harmless. They can give quite a significant pinch, but they're very docile tempered and extremely reluctant to do so. I've handled tons of these, 
and I've never been pinched, let alone stung. Now this one is a male, and you can tell by those proportionately large pincers and that little notch in the claw there. I'd like to add that this feature, while it does work for these scorpions, is not some universal trait for sexing scorpions as a whole, but it does make this species distinctively easy to sex. And oh, I don't believe it. I don't believe it. I don't believe it. What was that voice? It's a red triangle slug. Okay, 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 calm that voice down, calm that voice down. It's a red triangle slug. Okay, I gotta try and get that. So I'll grant it's hardly in the best condition. It was probably having a good old snooze before I disturbed it, but here we have one of Australia, or indeed the world's, most spectacular slugs, Triboniophorus graphi, the aptly named Red Triangle Slug. Now this is quite possibly the largest species of terrestrial slug native to Australia. Australia does have some larger species, but they are introduced. And it's a pity that I haven't seemed to have found this one in its most flattering moment, being covered in bits of dirt and all that, because these slugs are honestly absolutely stunning. But since it does not appear to be in any mood for the limelight, I'm just gonna put this fellow back. Are you kidding me? Are you One log. There's a funnel web too. Three. <laughs> yeah, I'm lost for words, so yeah, I'm just gonna do the Jimmy Carr laugh. I can't believe it. I did say in the introduction that this was gonna be a cracking adventure, and I think I was proven right. Oh, hi, another funnel web. So, given the location, this would probably be Hadronigi infensa. It's the most widespread species of funnel web here in southeastern Queensland. Oh, there's another one. Two funnel webs under the same log. This one is probably a bit smaller given the diameter of the entrances. And here's the web of another mygalomorph. It's not a funnel web, the texture of the silk is quite different. Uh, and I can't see the spider, so I can't be completely sure about what it is. And I do need to do a bit of homework on the local mygalomorphs around my area. Uh, oh, another funnel web! <laughs> another funnel web! Oh my god. What a day. As I began to head back uphill, the rainforest gave way once more to open eucalypt forest. And some familiar faces. Oh. Hi. Big male, Holconia imanis. Hello mate, how you going? What an absolute beauty of a spider. Okay, someone's a bit skittish, that's fine. Uh, yeah, yeah, no way I'm squeezing my camera in there, so goodbye. This little spider that is very well camouflaged against the charred surface of this tree is Argiope ocyaloides. And these are closely related to those banded orb weavers or St. Andrew's cross spiders, I should hold my camera still, that can be found all over the world, but their appearance is of course a lot more cryptic. Now it may be hard to notice, but this spider does actually spin an orb web but unlike those of most orb weavers, it sits it right up against the trunk of this tree. So instead of targeting insects flying through the air, a web like this is more likely to capture something that's crawling along the tree trunk or maybe coming in to land on it. Very interesting spider either way, and my camera is, uh, is having the struggle of its life trying to focus on it, but that's all good. Ah, looks like someone's left their old clothes hanging outside. So this is the malt of a Holconia species, probably Imanis. In fact, it's, yeah, it's definitely a safe bet here that nearly any huntsman oh, you'll find is Imanis. And I see the owner in there. It's another, yeah, it's Imanis indeed, and it's another male. Where'd you go? Okay, I'm, I'm genuinely confused. Where did the spider go? And I've just found what looks like another Ostrosalomona falcata. And if it isn't, then it's probably still a member of the Conocephalinae subfamily. 
Okay, quick correction. While this is indeed a member of the Conocephalinae subfamily, it is not Ostrosalamona falcata, but a member of the genus Niscara. And stuff like this, I guess, is the drawback to on-the-spot narration. Sometimes I get stuff wrong and I have to go back and fact check. And this one is definitely a female, and I can tell that because of this structure poking out at the end. That's called an ovipositor, and it's what female katydids, where are you? There you are. It's what female katydids use to insert their eggs into the substrate. I don't, oh, there's another one here. Hello. Oh, and a huntsman. Up here is what looks like another Isopeda vaster. I can't see it really clearly. Up, uh, yep, that is Isopeda vaster for sure. You can see those dark glabrous chelicerae at the front, and like I said when I found the last Isopeda vaster, they're also quite swollen in appearance. Anyway, where was that Katie did? There we are. So this one actually looks like it's a male. There's no ovipositor sticking out at the end, and just like the female, it's also a nymph. So none of the Ostrosalamona I've found so far today are actually fully grown. And that is it for this video, which honestly might be one of my favourite ever outdoor films. If you enjoyed this, then I have plenty of other videos in which I find critters in the great outdoors, so feel free to check those out if you're interested. Thank you very much for watching, that is it from me, and I shall see you again very soon.